because a lot of attention is focused on Trump's behavior and the kind of bigotry that he speaks, but it's really kind of the policies that are the danger and what will be the political agenda. They are very conscious of their ability to exploit weaknesses on the Democratic side. So it will not just be Trump coming to power if he comes back in, but all that he brings with him. The implicit endorsement is that CPAC and ACU are okay with literal neo-Nazis being at their event. All of those things that are supposed to be mainstream were absolutely converging with the Nazis. Welcome to episode 192 of the Refuse Fascism podcast, a podcast brought to you by volunteers with Refuse Fascism. I'm Sam Goldman, one of those volunteers and host of the show. Refuse Fascism exposes, analyzes, and stands against the real danger and threat of fascism coming to power in the United States. Right up front, what do we mean when we talk about fascism? We're talking about the danger posed by the Republican Party as a fascist party, fomenting and relying on overt and vicious white supremacy, xenophobia, male supremacy, oppressive, quote unquote, traditional values for rule through brute force, refusing to accept any outcome of elections that do not declare them the victors, gutting the rule of law or turning it into a bludgeon to further shred the rights of the people dictatorship, rule by open violence, readying, and in many places where they hold power, already inflicting violence on immigrants, people of color, women, LGBTQ people, and their political enemies. What is crucial to understand is that once in power, fascism essentially eliminates traditional democratic rights. In today's episode, we're sharing an interview with Dr. Clarence Lussain on the catastrophe posed by Trump 2.0, Plus, you'll hear from journalist Amanda Moore, who helped uncover the presence of open Nazis at CPAC this year. Thanks to everyone who rates and reviews the show, like Richard Sokal, who wrote on Apple Podcasts, great news, updates, and substantive interviews. Vitally important discussion in good hands. Glad to hear you think so, Richard. And to everyone else, help this show get into more ears during a year when refusing fascism is most crucial. Review our show on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen, after listening, of course. Click the share button in your app to send this episode to a friend. We couldn't run today's episode without saluting those who poured into the streets, in many places in pouring rain, to call for an end to the ongoing genocide in Gaza made possible by the U.S. government. Before we get to the interview, I wanted to touch on some developments from the week as they relate to the now undeniable, but widely denied and discounted, fascist threat, even as the threat of Trump walking right back into the White House is terrifyingly likely. It would rock the world if the highest court in any other country were to consider presidential immunity, the ability for the president to openly commit crimes, and there weren't people flooding the streets with cries of illegitimate, refusing to back down until the fascist wannabe president was held to account. But here we are in 2024, and the U.S. Supreme Court has decided to hear the immunity case, absent mass international condemnation, silence. One could easily imagine civic organizations and threatened political parties calling people into the streets, the president going on TV with a plan assuring people that there will be accountability. Here, however, the highest court has the ability to hand Trump the keys to power without explicitly doing so and meet no resistance. It is a story of a never-ending coup, of an opposition party unwilling and perhaps incapable of stopping them, beholden to the stability of the system over justice, and a people so eager to be placated and to be told fairy tales. This past week, the Supreme Court of the United States granted Trump cert and will consider presidential immunity setting oral arguments for April 22nd. Consequentially, through this ruling on Wednesday, Trump's D.C. criminal trial, the one concerning his attempt to steal the 2020 presidential election, must be delayed for at least another two months. The court has already effectively delayed his trial for two and a half months in an order handed down last December. This is nothing short 
of a victory for fascism. And the possibility he'll even have a trial for attempting to overthrow an election is quickly evaporating, just in time for him to possibly do it again. Let's just sit for a sec with the fact that they are even pausing to think for months about Trump's claim that the Constitution forbids any prosecution of a former president for any official acts he engaged in while in office. Remember Trump's lawyer saying, yeah, Trump could order SEAL Team 6 to assassinate a political rival and not be prosecuted unless the president was first successfully impeached and convicted by the Senate. Impeached and convicted by, yeah, lawmakers who, under Trump's argument, the president could order to be killed if they attempted to impeach him. As Mike Rothschild previous guest of the show, so aptly tweeted, quote, the Supreme Court needs more time to decide if being the president makes you a god king who can have your enemies murdered, end quote. We're talking about the same Supreme Court that has turned fascist Congress people's pipe dreams into law without those meddlesome legislative things like hearings or votes. This week, both Donald Trump and Joe Biden visited the Texas-Mexico border. Let's set the scene. Deadly razor wire strung along the Rio Grande around Eagle Pass. Numerous people, including small children, have drowned as a result. Texas has occupied the city park of Eagle Pass with National Guard troops, and Abbott recently ordered construction of a permanent military base just south of the town. Texas' onslaught has the full support of Donald Trump and 24 Republican governors. Abbott and his fellow fascists are aiming to undermine and delegitimize the authority of the federal government in service of a genocidal Trump-fueled MAGA fascism. So, of course, Trump headed to Eagle Pass, a symbol of state defiance of the federal government to more cruelly dehumanize and harm migrants. He met with Abbott and Texas National Guard soldiers who have commandeered the park and put up the razor wire to slice the skin of migrants as they struggle to get to land for safety. Trump amped up his 2016 anti-immigrant toxic garbage, calling migrants criminals, terrorists, quote-unquote, poisoning the blood of the country. His promise, if he returns to power, as you'll hear more from Dr. Lusain, is mass detentions and deportations unlike anything seen before. We see previews of the violent horror show that would face migrant and brown communities in recent legislation in Arizona, where the GOP is advancing a bill that would allow people to murder someone for attempting to trespass or trespassing on their property, which would legalize the murder of undocumented immigrants who often have to cross ranches that sit on the state's border with Mexico. We see it in Georgia, where House Republicans are backing a bill that would require every eligible police and sheriff's department to help identify undocumented immigrants, arrest them, and detain them for deportation. So when Biden visited, he proceeded to remove the wire, federalizing control of the Texas National Guard, bringing in federal agents to ensure the wire stay removed. Um, no. Instead, Biden, which we do have to note has deported more immigrants than any previous president, vowed to shut down the border and essentially eliminate asylum, said this in Texas. Quote, Here's what I would say to Mr. Trump. Instead of playing politics with the issue, instead of telling members of Congress to block this legislation, join me or I'll join you in telling the Congress to pass this bipartisan border security bill. We can do it together, you know, and I know it's the toughest, most efficient, most effective border security bill this country has ever seen. So instead of playing politics with the issue, why don't we just get together and get it done? End quote. What we see in Texas is an escalation of the open conflict between the Republic fascists, spearheaded by Abbott, embraced by Trump, versus Democrats, led by Biden. This conflict is over how intensely and viciously anti-immigrant policy will be enforced. And yet this conflict concentrates deeper differences over the fascist remaking of society and exemplifies the Democrats' approach of still trying to reconcile and collaborate with these Republic fascists. We urge our listeners to act now to call out the demonization of our immigrant siblings, to support and defend migrants under attack as part of refusing fascism. The election in November is fast approaching, and with each passing week, it seems fantasies of election season reach maddening new heights. Three years and two months after the January 6th coup attempt and Trump leaving office, he has not been held accountable for any of his crimes committed as president. It's been almost seven years since the start of the Mueller investigation, the first of many major investigations into his political crimes, but it seems millions of people are convinced that in the next nine months, somehow, 
the legal system or the attorney general's office or the Biden administration will suddenly unearth some super secret leak proof cachet of urgent, efficient action to stop fascism. But no, the thing about this is no amount of voting can rectify it. They aren't missing your vote to convict Trump. Right now, as it stands, the lack of accountability, he can just do it again, this time with a legal precedent, perhaps. I don't think we miss some separate referendum on whether they're allowed to or capable of holding Trump accountable. This shows two things. One, there is no solution to fascism within the normal workings of the system, judicial or electoral or otherwise. And two, we, the people who refuse fascism, need to be the ones leading the fight. Right now, we see instead of fighting fascism, the Biden administration fighting its own voter base, blaming their own base of support for Trump's viability, scolding decent people who don't want a fascist future for not being loyal enough to a genocidal democratic vision of empire that, in my opinion, the Democrats exist to prop up. It needs to become clear that for the goal of defeating fascism this year cannot be defined by a day in November. Yes, things are shaping up. What happens in the election and the response to that election is something we need to prepare for. We need to be thinking of the possible scenarios and how we'll respond. But for defeating fascism, right now, what we do over the next months is decisive. Decent people in this country must decide what horror we will accept, whose suffering we will dismiss, what monsters we will absolve, what demands we will obey, what of all this we will justify as the unstoppable will of history racing by, or if not, what will we actually do about it? Now, here is my conversation with Dr. Clarence Lusane. Dr. Clarence Lusane is a political science professor and current director of the International Affairs Program and majors at Howard University. He's an author, activist, scholar, lecturer, and journalist. He is an independent expert to the European Commission Against Racism and Intolerance. His latest book is $20 and Change, Harriet Tubman and the Ongoing Fight for Racial Justice and Democracy. Welcome, Dr. Lucien. Thanks for chatting with me. Thank you so much for having me. I guess what I wanted to start with is on a lot of people's minds, and we've had guests that have spoken to various aspects of this, but right now, aided and abetted by the Supreme Court of the United States that he helped curate. The possibility of a Trump return to power is seeming great and grave in the likelihood increasing. I wanted to start by getting into what a second Trump term would mean. In some of your writing, you'd describe it as a catastrophe. And I just was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what you think we need to be paying most attention to in terms of the threat that is posed. So that's a really important question because a lot of attention is focused on Trump's behavior and the kind of bigotry that he speaks, but it's really kind of the policies that are the danger and what will be the political agenda So it would not just be Trump coming to power if he comes back in, but all that he brings with him and who he brings with him. This is really terrifying because as bad as the first Trump tenure was, this was really just sort of wetting his feet. There are a lot of weak, but some obstacles to an agenda he was trying to carry out from there being establishment kind of Republicans who did not feel any kind of love for Donald Trump to hiring people, bringing people into administration who were loyal but incompetent. And they are not planning to make those mistakes again. Trump has reconstructed the uh, Republican Party from top to bottom. So it really is the Trump Party. We see it already in the House of Representatives, very likely in the U.S. Senate, states across the country. Uh, They have all been Trumpified over the last four years, and much more so than in 2016. And we've seen the proposals that are being developed from the Heritage Foundation and their Project 2025 to other conservative and far-right think tanks. They're laying out an agenda. The Heritage document is 900 pages, and it goes through every single government agency 
with an agenda of how to transform those agencies. This will not be, can't underscore it, a normal Republican conservative administration. This will be an extreme authoritarianism that will likely, if Trump comes back in, respond to the rejection of that with force. And we will likely see political violence coming from the federal government under Trump's watch. So it is a very grave concern that a second Trump administration will be something we have not seen most of our lifetimes in the United States. What you were talking about in terms of transforming or gutting the party of anyone that isn't a loyalist is something that we've seen happen with the example of changing RNC leadership, those types of things, but also in terms of sidelining anyone who remotely like criticizes an aspect of a program, even if they went along with Trump's policy agenda, if they criticized at one point the coup attempt, then they were sidelined. But what we're seeing now in the threat posed by Project 2025 is the purging of government officials that are not people that are partisan or anything like that, but have worked for the government for decades, but might be loyal to what they see as the Constitution or something like that, and not loyalty to Herr Trump. So I think that that clarification that you were making is a really important one in terms of this isn't going to be more of the same as awful as that was the first time around. You talked about the threat of political violence. Is there anything historically that would help us understand both the combination of these America First pledge and this political violence that he's throwing? Oh, there certainly is. You know, I've focused a lot on, in my discussions and some writings, on what I call racial authoritarianism. And by that, I mean that authoritarianism in the United States will not be without its racial dimensions that would be very critical to that. There's a lot of rejection of, you know, how far the U.S. will go in those directions, that there are roadblocks and there are fences, that the system is protected. But I remind people that for a hundred years following the Civil War, Black people lived under authoritarianism. We call it Jim Crow segregation, but it's what some scholars would call sub-authoritarianism, where a part of the country lives under more or less democratic norms, but other parts of the country do not. They are not subject to the same criminal justice system. They're not subject to the same rights. They're not subject to opportunities for political inclusion or holding political office. And that exactly was the situation for African-Americans, Hispanic-Americans, Native Americans, Asian-Americans for decades This was government driven. So this wasn't just a few racist segregationists. There was it was government policy that shaped housing, that shaped education, that shaped political access. So there is a history in this country. I spend a lot of time outside of the country for the work I do. And specifically, I visited places where there were genocides in Rwanda, in Cambodia, Germany and Bosnia. And in all of those places, there were normal societies at a point where people had differences, but they kind of worked them out. But extremism grew. It was not checked. And then within a very short period, extremists came to power. And so we have to be really, really careful. There's no such thing as sort of a little authoritarianism. It manifests and it grows and then it metastasizes. Already what we're hearing from what the Trump second term would look like should have people shaking in their boots. They really want to build a gulag for immigrants. They're talking about building camps around the country, similar to the camps that were used against the Japanese, the Japanese Americans and people of Japanese ancestry during World War II. These are not camps. These are prisons. You can label them whatever they want. These are prisons. They want to send a message, and I believe they will, first day in office, institute this through an executive order, and they want to send a message that, you know, they're going to be tough, they're going to be very different, and anybody they deem not belong in the country, they're going to round up. And that would just be kind of the beginning. 
Trump, of course, when he first came in, tried to ban Muslims from coming from certain countries. And there was a check on that by Congress and by the Supreme Court. Trump has had, as you noted earlier, three individuals that he put on the court since then. And we've seen some of their rulings already and how those have already eroded the rights of people in this country. So we can expect much more of that in a second term. I really appreciated the warning that you were making around what I see as this American exceptionalism that allows us to think that It can't, it couldn't, even though it has, it is, and it will unless we change the tide. I think that there's this constant clinging to these guardrails and the belief that there's these unpenetrable institutions that are so America that they're so strong, they're so good for everyone that this can't come to pass. And there's this continued surprise and shock and paralyzation because of that. Each time he is able to push through what that perceived crisis is, whether it be the trials, you know, it's, oh, he can't, the Mueller report, the this, the that, you know, it's always something. And then he's able to do it anyway. There's that shock. And I think that it's really important this time when, as you said, there's a whole huge document that anyone could pick up and read that shows so clearly what the threat is. There cannot be, we cannot afford to be surprised. Now is the time to act, not after. What happened? You were a Alluding to the comparisons to the internment camps, it made me think about one of the pieces that you'd recently written in relation to the prospect of Trump's second term. You wrote about America's Japanese internment camps and the Reconstruction Amendments. And on top of the what I would classify as fascist, utter dehumanization of non-citizens, it seems that they have their sights set on destroying the modern idea of citizenship and all the rights that come with that. And I was hoping that you could talk a little bit about what does citizenship mean to them? Why is it such a threat to them? And what have those around Trump, the Republican Party, been saying and doing to undermine it? So great question. First, let me respond to one point you raised that I thought was really important about norms. There's been a reliance on norms to protect democracy, and that's not enough. That does not work. As we've seen Trump push through every norm possible, there are basically no consequences. They didn't have legal health behind them. And so that's really, really kind of critical. So I think there's a three-stage kind of approach that we're going to see relative to the issue of citizenship. One is going after people who do not have legal documents to be in the country. And that varies. A lot are students who overstay their visa. They didn't try to come to the country illegally. They stayed. That happened to me. I was living in London and I ended up overstaying my visa primarily because the visa application was slowed down and it went past the date I was supposed to be in there. So it's not that people are all in the country because they illegally want to be here. So, but it's going after that uh, community which Trump labels poisoning the blood of the country, uh, all of that. Second, even during World War II with the Japanese, many of them were citizens. So there were some who were visitors to the country, but many were citizens. So they weren't the right kind of citizens. So you build up a hatred and a bigotry against a certain community, uh, then you can target them because you've set the stage for them to be dehumanized. And then the third stage will be going after, in similar ways, your ideological enemies who may be of any race or any color, citizen or not, they become the target as well. This is who Trump called vermin. And so they've used the language and everything that Trump has said has been said by Steve Miller, Steve Bannon, all the people in and around Trump, and it echoes and echoes and echoes. So you create an atmosphere where you're not going after people, you're going after enemies and anything is allowed. 
that's where there's a real responsibility to call that out. The media has a real important role in doing that. I went to a book talk the other day for a new book by Barbara McQuay called Attack from Within, and she discusses disinformation, how that will play such a critical role, has been, will continue to play such a critical role in how people view the country and, and citizenship and all those issues and race and everything. And one of the questions I raised is, what will the media do when after the election in November, Trump comes on almost immediately and declares that he's the winner? Do they broadcast that? Do they let that sit on social media? This is just straight up disinformation, you know, lies. They didn't last time. Trump came on within hours after the election, said we won. That set the seed for what would eventually happen January 6th. And to this day, like 60, 70 percent of Republicans still think Trump won the election. So how do you shut that down? Can you shut it down? Should you shut it down? You know, these are questions that we're going to be confronted with. It's not going to be theoretical. The election is not going to resolve the differences in the country. It's absolutely not going to accept losing. So is the country prepared for that? And then are we prepared if Trump wins? How do we begin to deal with that? These are essential questions and questions that I agree we need to be asking now, not November 6th. Afterward is not going to be tenable. Even as Trump's vitriol against everyone who's not white has escalated, I feel like so have his often unhinged attempts to win support from Black folks. Even with little evidence of an increase in support, I looked at data that was put out recently and by no means growing numbers of Black folks saying yes to Trump. Definitely nowhere near the majority. Yet it seems Trump, much of the media, and his prominent supporters like Tim Scott have no problem claiming much more widespread support of Trump in the Black community. And you've studied Black politics in the electoral arena for decades. And I was wondering if you had any insight to shed here on what's happening there, what they might think they're doing and what they're actually doing. Yeah, so I've been working on this for a while, what I call Trumping while Black. While there may or may have not been some growth in terms of Trump getting more Black votes, in terms of overall support, not at all. But they are very conscious of their ability to exploit weaknesses on the Democratic side, one being Biden's age. So even though he's very much close to Trump in age, they have weaponized that. So in some of the surveys, Black voters, we just did one from Howard University, uh, there are others, when asked what do people see as their greatest concern about Biden, It's age, not policies, not anything that that really affects your life directly. It's age. They do not say the same thing about Trump because Biden has put forth this 95-year-old doddering dude and Trump has put forth this basically kind of seven-year-old, you know, running around with, you know, crazy energy. That really kind of does have, it has had an impact uh, in the Black community. But more specifically, they actually have targeted Uh, trying to increase their black vote because in the places where Trump lost in 2020 in Michigan and in Pennsylvania and in Georgia, Wisconsin, they want to have impact on the black vote in Detroit, in Atlanta, in Philadelphia. Part of it is if they can win some votes, but also if they can convince people just not to vote that, okay, we're both terrible. We're both horrible. Just don't go out and vote. All of which accused to Trump. And there are a number of organizations uh, that are trying to carry that weight. The Black Conservative Federation, for example, where Trump spoke right before a South Carolina primary. I listened to the whole thing. He gave like an hour and a half of the most rambling, crazy talk you ever heard in your life. But he kept hitting, you know, those popular buttons, imitated Biden, called him, you know, slow Joe and sleepy Joe and dumb Joe. And, you know, he attacked Nancy Pelosi, attacked Obama talked about immigrants, just hit all of those spots. You know, it was a complete nonsensical talk, but you could see for Black conservatives, at least those Black conservatives, they have swallowed the pill and they were reacting just as you see, you know, the white conservatives who support Trump. So 
Then I think the other thing that's very possible is that Trump will pick a black running mate. Tim Scott, Byron Donalds, Ben Carson, any of those who have shown 1,000% loyalty, who basically say we will do what Pence would not do. Again, trying to particularly win more black male support, they may do that move. But again, we have to call it out for what it is. It's a cynical, ridiculous gesture. It's not going to mask what's going to be policies that are going to be harmful to the black community, to other communities of color, to working people, LGBTQ communities. You know, we got to call all of that out. Some of it is just, if it weren't so dangerous, it would be comical. Like him going to sneaker con in Philly with his ridiculous Trump shoe or him trying to woo black folks and talking about how he's liked because he's persecuted. Things that are just proving how overt his white supremacy is. And yet he's like, no, this is great. This is great. And again, like, I would love to be able to laugh it off, but it's dangerous. It's very dangerous. And it reflects Trump's view of the Black community, that it's a criminal community, it's a poor community, it's an ignorant community. You know, there are no professionals, only live in, you know, hardcore ghetto places. This is his view. And it's been his view. He hasn't changed his view. And the few exceptions are the Black people who like him. So they're different. So Ben Carson and Byron Donalds, you know, these are not like the regular other Black people who won't vote for me, who are living in these horrible, horrible situations that only I can fix. And so that's, you know, kind of the selling point he puts out there. And unfortunately, they carry the weight for that vantage point. But Trump's policies and Trump's views on race are as horrid as they ever were. And they don't bring up Trump sits down to dinner with Nick Fuentes and Trump cohorts with, you know, all kinds of white supremacists. That is just kind of erased from the picture. But, you know, we got to call all of that out. Absolutely. I wanted to ask you about the latest developments from the Supreme Court, where they have given Trump's immunity argument, sir, entertaining the notion of the president as absolute ruler and basically acting as his accomplice by delaying his prosecution once more. Trump is already claiming that he intends to be, as you, I think, said earlier, a quote unquote dictator for a day. And what does it mean that he's essentially making the legal argument for that, that SCOTUS is entertaining it, and that it's being legitimized in the discourse? Yeah. uh, So there are a couple of concerns. One is that, again, they even take up this issue that the president has total immunity and that pretty much he can commit murder and crime and anything he wants for four years with there being no consequences. That is just kind of nonsense. So why they would even take it up is problematic. The guess is, which I think is probably right, is that there are at least a couple of members on the court who want to debate the issue. The consequence of that, though, is it does probably mean that the trial, probably not only the January 6th trial out of D.C., but the documents trial out of uh, Florida will probably be delayed. And if they're delayed too much, then they will not happen before uh, the election. Trump will have whoever he puts in the Justice Department will bury those cases so they never see the light of day again. So it's a big concern that legitimate charges against Trump that were determined by grand juries. It wasn't a single prosecutor who said, I'm a charge Trump. You know, it had to go through a process. It had to go through judges. So that needs to be emphasized. But there is a possibility that those two federal charges, federal trials, will not happen before the election. There's a lot of reform that needs to happen because Trump's privileged kind of treatment should not exist in the legal system. But he's got all kinds of privileges and protections that you and I would never get for a second or none of his supporters. I wanted to pivot to fascism rising around the world. Folks here like to think we're the center of the universe, but we are not. Over the past few years, we've covered on the show the international rise of fascism with episodes focusing on various different times and developments in Brazil, Hungary, the Philippines, 
Israel, Palestine, and conversations touching on many other parts of the globe. You've conducted field research on human rights and race relations in dozens of countries. And I wanted to ask if there are developments happening that you think people in the United States are not as aware of in terms of the global rise that people should know about. So I think for many people, when they think of fascism, they think historically and they think of these fascist leaders coming to power through violent means, through overthrowing governments. What we're seeing, though, is that people are coming to power through electoral systems. Once in power, then they exploit and then often disabuse their constitution or the laws that govern that country. The Spanish have a term for it called el golpe, which means self, self-coup, self which is what Trump tried to do. They get to power through systems they can exploit and then never want to leave. Now, if you're looking at Argentina, you're looking at Italy, you're looking at Hungary, you're looking at Turkey, you're looking at the Netherlands. In all of these countries, uh, you're seeing the far right stepping into electoral politics as kind of their way to power. I sit on um, a commission, it's called European Commission Against Racism and Intolerance. That's part of the Council of Europe. And all of the member states, 46 members, states have representatives. We are called independent experts. And we spend all of our time reviewing every single country in Europe around issues of racism and intolerance, focus on homophobia, transphobia, Islamophobia, and if other ways in which hate and intolerance kind of manifest. And I go three or four times a year to the plenary sessions, and I'm bombarded with questions about what's going on in the U.S. because people read the papers and they see the news, but they can't even believe some of it. So, you know, I end up having many sessions discussing how the norms in the U.S. have been eroded and how someone like Trump can come to power, can have a base, has almost single-handedly taken over one of the major political parties. And then I point to, well, you know, look at the UK, look at France, you know, look at these countries where, you know, they've had these traditional liberal parties, traditional conservative parties, but doors open up and you saw these far right forces being able to come in and and begin to have an impact. And look at Germany with, you know, the AFT. There's a lot of developments that are going on that require looking at each other and drawing some conclusions about what are the ways to kind of prevent these rises. In the U.S., I think that there are a range of constitutional changes that need to be made, like the Electoral College, for example, needs to go because it's the door for someone becoming president who's not popular. Donald Trump has never won probably would not again win the popular vote, but he could become president for the second time. We need to reform the U.S. Senate. The way it runs and operates has been undemocratic. With Mitch McConnell stepping down and probably some MAGA senator taking his place, if they control the Senate, it will become even less democratic than it is already. We need to reform how we put people on the Supreme Court. It can't be the whim of literally one person deciding when someone will go up and when someone can't go up. I got 20 more changes I would recommend. But, you know, these are areas that have functioned kind of with norms, kind of with some policies and procedures. But when you really kind of pull it back the onion, then you see there's really problems in terms of how a autocratic, anti-democratic force can exploit them. I want to thank you so much, Dr. Lusain, for coming on and sharing your expertise, your perspective, and your time with us. Looking for a way to engage deeper with the content of the shows to build understanding and community aimed at preventing the consolidation of fascism? Carolyn in Hawaii recently wrote to us to share that she hosts biweekly Zooms to discuss one of the podcasts from those past two weeks, sharing the word about these events through a newsletter and social media. If you're having in-person or virtual discussions fueled by the podcast, we want to know about them and other creative ways you are using the show as a tool. Tag us on social media at Refuse Fascism or DMS the Deets. Want to be part of a community like this? 
become a patron and join us for virtual events, sign up for $5 a month over at patreon.com slash refuse fascism. Last month, the Conservative Political Action Conference welcomed explicit Nazis to their annual convention outside of Washington, D.C. Yes, that CPAC. Ushered into prominence by Ronald Reagan, that CPAC where Trump made his more or less official entry into national politics in 2011, that CPAC which during the Trump years became instrumental in transforming the quote-unquote conservative movement into a fascist juggernaut, that CPAC where Trump made his first public appearance after the January 6th insurrection, a triumphant return to his hardened base of support. This year, CPAC was a little different for a number of reasons, even as more seats sat empty, even as the halls lacked some of the shine of past years, the conference brought in and embraced fascists from around the world, from Bolsonaro Jr., Hungary's ambassador to the U.S., and one of many prime ministers of Great Britain, to the current leaders of Argentina and El Salvador alongside their keynote speaker, Donald Trump. We spoke with Amanda Moore, who was there, who got kicked out, who exposed the gleeful embrace between neo-Nazis and the mainstream of Republic fascist politics. Here is that conversation. So last week, I shared a little bit about how CPAC kicked off with Pizzagate conspiracist Jack Posbiak, kicking it off with democracy, we're here to overthrow it completely, and Trump promising to be the crowd's retribution But I left out a lot of things. I did leave out Stephen Miller calling for the border to be sealed, to deport all illegals, to establish large-scale staging grounds for removal flights, deputizing the National Guard, and deploying military to the southern border. And very importantly, that there were explicit neo-Nazis that were welcomed at what some call the most mainstream establishment conservative conference. It's truly no surprise that a crowd who gives straight up Hitlerian speeches a standing ovation has open Nazis in the crowd, but there's more to unpack there. So to discuss that, I am so glad to be joined by Amanda Moore, whose critical journalism exposed the overt Nazi presence at CPAC this year. While the Nazis were welcomed, she was actually kicked out of the conference. I'm really glad to get to hear all about it from her. Amanda is a writer and researcher who focuses on far-right extremism. Welcome, Amanda. Thanks for chatting with me. Thank you for having me. First, let's talk about CPAC briefly for those who don't know what it is. What is it and who generally participates in it? So it's the annual conservative gathering. I mean, it used to be much smaller. It wasn't as much of like a big show. I was in a smaller venue. And I want to say we'd have more normal people because it, CPAC was always a little bit of the, the weirdos. Like Ron Paul would go to it. But it's over time gotten more and more circus-like, I would say. <laughs> like maybe they're trying to imitate the Turning Point USA with a smaller budget. So you'll have Stephen Miller, you'll have Steve Bannon now, who was previously banned. You'll have Nazis now, all kind of hanging out in the same space. It usually is four days, I think it was three this year, of speeches. There's an exhibit hall where, you know, there's various vendors. And that's pretty much it. It's dying, though. It used to be in the heyday of Trump. It was very exciting. And especially during COVID, it was huge because that was the only thing to do. But this year was pretty sad, sad display. Walk us through what happened this year at CPAC. I know that there had been some word that at the beginning, Schlapp had said no journalists or something like that. Um, Walk us through what happened there and what your experience was. So first, I want to say I was credentialed media in 2023, and it was not a problem. So this year I applied and they're so disorganized. They don't send you a confirmation email when you apply for media. So I applied in like early January. As soon as you could, I applied for press credentials. And then like four weeks later, I was like, hmm, maybe I forgot to apply. So I'm going to do it again. But then I realized I had definitely done it twice. So that's important in a minute. A week before CPAC, I get an email. You're approved. No problems. They start sending me the press emails over the next few days. And the Monday before CPAC, I get another email that says, you're rejected. And I thought, because I'm an idiot, I was like, maybe this is because I applied twice. And they just have two different files for it. So I showed up uh, Wednesday for a press check-in, and they were like, no, you're revoked. But just hours before I had gotten there, Matt Schlapp had gone on Steve Bannon's show and said, 
we're going to deny or take away press credentials from the left-wing propagandists. And if you want to come to the event, you can buy a ticket like everyone else. So I asked the women working, can I buy a ticket? And they said, oh, yeah. And I said, well, I get kicked out. And they were like, that's never happened. So no, you won't get kicked out. I bought a ticket. The next day, first day of CPAC, I go. And within hours, a security guard named Tim is taking the badge off my neck and saying, I have to leave the premises. And he said, I could stay at the hotel, the lobby. I could stay in the restaurants, anywhere I wanted. But I could not come back to CPAC. What rationale was given? You had paid for it. I was on a red flag list. And I was never to be admitted at all. And it was an error I was ever allowed in the door. Did this happen to other journalists that you're aware of? No, it didn't. In fact, Mother Jones in the middle of ZFAC wrote an article about how they had bought a ticket. Some outlets just chose to not attend. They just didn't go. But other ones that bought tickets, there was another reporter for a different, far more left outlet that did not get kicked out, standing next to me watching me get kicked out. I wanted to hear from you what happened after that. So you decided not to leave. What did you end up observing, experiencing in your time kicked out of CPAC in the lobby, in the bar area, wherever else you were allowed to be? Anywhere you go during CPAC is full of CPACians. Most of the time I stayed right in the hotel lobby. And as soon as I got kicked out, I'm sitting there and I tweeted about it. And I, of course, had to like tell my editor, I think the direction for the story has changed because I will not be talking about the panels. A Nazi that I know walked by and he was like, hey, heard you got kicked out. Man, if I get kicked out, I'll come hang out with you here and we can start a coalition, an anti cpac coalition. And I was like, Ryan, you're not getting kicked out. You're going to be allowed in. And he was like, yeah, I know. And he was. The Nazi got to walk right on in. That was how this opened up for me. <laughs> And can you tell listeners a little bit more about what you mean there were Nazis at CPAC? So Ryan Sanchez, we'll start with him. He's the one who offered to form this coalition with me. So he used to be a member of Identity Europa, which you might remember from Unite the Right. And he was also a member of RAM, the racist street fighting gang. He was kicked out of the Marine Corps for being too much of a white nationalist. And this is like extremely well known, extremely documented. Ryan has a channel on Cozy, which is Nick Fuentes' streaming service. He's friends with Nick Fuentes, streams on his service. You know, that's what we're talking about here. And he's allowed into CPAC. In fact, last year at CPAC, Ryan and some of his friends surrounded me and called me a slut for six minutes on a live stream. This year, they were a little bit more low key in their harassment than the uh, slut circle. Another one of Ryan's friends, his name is Colton Buss. He actually just got kicked out of the Young Republican Club for being a Nazi. He was happy to show me the backgrounds on his phone were swastikas and other Hitler imagery. He asked me to recite the 14 words. I'm not a Groyper. I'm not a, I'm not a Nick Fuentes acolyte. You know, I'm more extreme than that. And he also had a ticket to CPAC and was also allowed inside CPAC. No problems. In the video that you posted, I believe that there's at least four men in this video, and they are basically taunting you. I, I don't know another way to describe that by say Kyling around you. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience? So in the video, uh, Ryan's the one saluting. Colton is the one taking the photo. And those are the two that have CPAC access. There were two other men. One is Greg Conti, who was Richard Spencer's bodyguard at Unite the Right. I mean, I feel like that says enough about him right there. And then the other was somebody else who was involved in that, the MPI, like Circles and National Justice Party. I think his last name, or I think the last thing he goes by is Vandal. They did not have tickets to CPAC, but they were in the, the physical hotel. And, and also to be clear, when Nick Fuentes was kicked out of CPAC last year, I watched it happen. He had to leave the room he had at the hotel. Like he was removed off the premises. So I don't know what the difference is there. But I know they could have done something after the sick aisle. It's a lot of discussion. You know, 14 words this. Why don't I have any white babies that? Hitler, that kind of stuff. The normal things you talk about with Nazis. And that was when Raya was like, we should take a picture. And I was like, we should not take a picture. So I just kind of have my head down and my middle finger up because you don't want to be in a photo with a Nazi. And so I did not know that he had done the salute at the time. Because when he posted the photo, that's not what he was doing in the photo. Their group had people coming and going, you know, but those were like the four core ones that were standing there. When this became known, what was the reaction at CPAC? They weren't removed. 
Do you know their level of participation in the conference, the degree to other people were interacting with them? What response CPAC made towards having overt Nazis at the conference? So the guy who, po- who took the video posted it Saturday night. And the conference ended Saturday. He posted it around 10.30 p.m. I was tagged in it. And I sent it to a few people that I had talked to throughout CPAC. One of them is the NBC journalist who posted it everywhere without any context or my name. And so CPAC was done at this point, which is probably why he waited to post it until then. Matt Schlapp had primarily was ignoring me. I sent before I published my article, I sent a detailed you know, list of questions. I think it was about 40, including things like... Because he says there were no Nazis at CPAC. And I said, well, um, do you consider Sig Heiling to be an expression of neo-Nazi beliefs? <laughs> like, things like that. He never got back to me. Nobody at AC ever got back to me. Eventually, after the article I wrote was out, Matt Schlapp subtweeted me instead of addressing me. Very cowardly. So I quote tweeted him and I said, why are you afraid to talk to me, Matt? And I asked him again about all the Nazis. And he said, I love Israel. So that's where Matt is. He loves Israel and the Bible. And there were no Nazis. And that was the only response from. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's crazy. Like, there's a video of it. I wanted to get your take on how you would describe the relationship between these explicit neo Nazis and the more mainstream fascists running the show and ostensibly filling the seats at CPAC. I have written a lot about Groypers or generic Hitler fans within young Republican clubs or within state GOPs. And this was fascinating because some of my young Republicans I write about were at this event. I don't know what happens inside CPAC. And I honestly can't speak to people who were over 50. I have no idea. So it was removed right away. And even if I hadn't been, I really wouldn't know much about the average person who's going to be there. But what I do know is that I watched as the members of the young Republican clubs that I write about that I are known to be more extreme, New York, DC, a lot of the uh, ones in Texas, you know, they're there and they're going to parties with Ryan Sanchez, who again was kicked out of the Marines for being too much of a racist. In terms of what I cover, all of those things that are supposed to be mainstream were absolutely converging with the Nazis. I mean, it was just happening everywhere. Every time I saw all these people, they were all getting to know one another, I guess. Do you have any thoughts on why it is that overt Nazis mingling at CPAC has not been really a, a major story that keeps getting not just hammered at, but further exposed I can tell you when I pitch stories to editors, not about this, but I say, hey, this guy in the GOP, he's friends with Nick Fuentes. He's a Nazi and he's getting billionaire money. They say everybody knows there's Nazis in the GOP. No one cares. And I'm like, I don't think that's true. I think a lot of people don't understand that. So I don't know. You have to ask an editor, not me my personal opinion, and I'm obviously biased because I'm in it, but I think it's a powerful video if you especially understand the context, because the implicit endorsement is that Schlapp and CPAC and ACU are okay with literal neo-Nazis not only being at their event, but harassing the journalists who would cover them. And honestly, covering it and not saying that it's a journalist they're harassing That's running cover for Nazis too, as far as I think. So I have no idea. I wish I knew because then I'd be able to sell my fucking stories, (laughs) but I don't know. I really appreciate that and the the context that you are providing on exactly why this should be a bigger story and more covered. As we close out our chat, I just wanted to find out if there's anything related to what your research focuses on that you think right now people are totally missing, not paying attention to or getting all wrong that you want to either clarify or get people to start paying attention to? Well, I've got some stuff coming out about this actually about Texas and the border and like what Abbott is doing at Eagle Pass. And I think that kind of the, everybody knew about the convoy and it was a joke. Like I went with the convoy. It was a joke. It was awful. What is happening in Eagle Pass, Texas? It's been a long-term plan of the fringe far right in the Texas GOP, and they have been slowly taking over the uh, Republican Party of Texas. I think it's going to be something. I think uh, what is happening at Eagle Pass, what Abbott is doing, he's not just doing it for fun. I think it's more serious than that, and I think that this coalition of states that are trying to buck the federal government in an election year 
It's probably something we should all be keeping an eye on, especially considering the kinds of people that have been pushing for this very conflict between the uh, state of Texas and the federal government at Eagle Pass. It's been a long time coming. Thanks so much for that reminder. And it's something that we're going to keep talking about on the show for sure. And I want to thank you, Amanda, for talking with me, for sharing your experience, your perspective, and your time. Where do you want to direct people who want to read more from you, hear more from you? So I'm on all social media, Twitter mostly, but also Threads, Blue Sky, Macedon, Facebook, Tumblr, I think, I as at no turtle soup 17. And then I have a sub stack at turtlediaries.net. Thanks so much. We'll be sure to link to those. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Refuse Fascism. Yeah, Trump can win. Fascism can seize and consolidate power. But the operative word here is can. That doesn't mean that it is inevitable. It doesn't mean it will. The future is unwritten. Which one we get is up to us right now. Share this podcast with one, five, or 5,000 people you know, because we can do every little thing in our power to escape reality, or we can take action to wake people up to this reality. We can keep the peace with fascists and their enablers and people who can't find it in themselves to give and damn. Or we can build up strong communities among people who share our values, who together recognize the threat of 21st century fascism, who encourage each other to take action to change the course of history. It's up to all of us. If you appreciate the show and want to help us reach more listeners to understand and act to stop the fascist threat, please become a patron. Whether you can give $2 or $20 a month, it all makes a difference in producing and promoting this independent, all-volunteer weekly podcast. Give today at patreon.com slash refusefascism or by visiting refusefascism.org and hitting the donate button. Want to make it monthly? Just select recurring donation. Thank you for your support and thanks for listening. We love hearing from you. Connect with us on social media. We're on Instagram, Threads, Mastodon, Blue Sky, Twitter, all those places, probably more at Refuse Fascism. Or leave us a voicemail, see the show notes. Reach me at the site previously known as Twitter that I continue to call Twitter at Sam B. Goldman. Or you can drop me a line at Samantha Goldman at refusefascism.org. And I have a TikTok, yes, still figuring it out. So join me on that journey over at Sam Goldman RF on the TikToks. Thanks to Richie Marini, Lena Thorne, and Mark Tingleman for helping produce this episode. Thanks to incredible volunteers, we have transcripts available for each show. So be sure to visit refusefascism.org and sign up to get them in your inbox. Until next Sunday, in the name of humanity, we refuse to accept a fascist America.